talk, execution, resurrection as two sides of, the, of a coin and you can't have a one-sided coin. And I did remind you also that many, many coins, maybe all coins, tend to have one side that's sort of actual, historical, factual, whereas the other side, the, the reverse very often is parabolic, symbolic, metaphorical. And I'm going to be talking tonight about the resurrection as the metaphor. And I'm going immediately, as we did last week, to share screen. And you will remember from last week that we're working with three themes, the history, what we think actually happened, the theology of that, and especially with, within the matrix of evolution. I'm really looking at this seriously from cosmic and human evolution. And once again, that's my favorite image of Christ. It comes from a piece of glassware, gilded glassware in an ordinary human house from the end of the 300s with the, the four evangelists in the corner. And actually, if it didn't say Christus, we'd have no idea who that was, male or female, and that's a bonus. All right, again, the question. This is just from last week to remind you. Could and should Jesus's execution resurrection, trying to say that at one time, change and transform humanity's evolutionary future? Apart from its role within Christianity, absolutely nothing wrong there, but can it go out to speak to the world in terms of evolution? That's our question. All right, the second lecture, the Jewish resurrection of Jesus. And I'm saying Jewish quite deliberately. I'm not trying just to be with it, but again, resurrection, as we will see in a few seconds, is an absolutely exclusively Jewish and in fact, Pharisaic Jewish concept and word and must be understood there. So Jesus not only lived and died as a Jew, he rose as a Jew. So the subtitle for this one is Christian Easter, human evolution against the background in sort of the lighter color is the Roman Empire and then the extra darker color is what Augustus added at the time of Jesus. All right, starting with this quotation from Jared Manley Hopkins, which I love. I, I think it's not even a full poem, it's a fragment. The, the title, Yes for a Time, is simply the opening words. He says, let me now jolt, shake and unseat your mortist metaphors. And since I'm not feeling quite so imperious as Father Hopkins, let me rephrase. Let us now together jolt, shake and unseat our mortist metaphors. You notice even to discuss metaphor, he has to use a, mort a, metaf a metaphor, mortist. And here's what we have to remember, of course. If a metaphor grows up, develops, becomes a narrative, we call it, as Jesus points there, a parable. So metaphor plus narrative equals parable. And again, if you don't like parables, please take it up with Jesus. It's not my idea. All right, the first part I want to speak tonight about, I'm going to call the great omission. This is a fact. In fact, I think the first couple of things we're going to talk about tonight before we get into interpretation are simple facts. So if the interpretation should be argued to be different, the facts are still there waiting to be explained. Here's the first fact. The major events in Jesus's life, everything say that the birth, the, the baptism, the transfiguration are directly described in the gospels. Even if they are <laughs> metaphorical or parabolical, they're described. So if you were an artist and your job in say the, the uh, Constantine's uh, court was to draw the pictures as you go through, say, a beautiful uh, manuscript of the Gospels. You'd know how to do it until you get to the most important one of them all, the resurrection, which is only indirectly described. 
by women and men at the empty tomb, by women and men having apparitions, visions of Jesus, but those are effects, results, consequences, proofs if you want, but not the event itself. It, it's almost as if we only had a description of the crucifixion as a pieta, as Mary holding her executed son on her lap, instead of getting a description. Take a look at this, for example. It's, it's, it's a tiny little ivory reliquary box, a four-sided box. Most boxes, I guess, have four sides unless they're round. Four sides, and it's only about four inches. It's really tiny, tiny. It's from the Maskell Collection in the British Museum, dating from the start of the fifth century, around the 420s. Look at the pictures. One side of the box shows Pilate washing his hands to left. You see Jesus carrying the cross, and he's almost kind of touching and forgiving uh, Peter. You see the woman, the, the maid saying to him, you were with him in Galilee and him saying, oh, we've never heard of the guy and don't know who he is. And so they, they've kind of integrated that. So that's one side. Second side counterpoints the suicide of Judas to left and the outstretched arms of Christ welcoming the world to right. Third side of the box, Notice the, the broken doors of the tomb. And notice, by the way, it doesn't look at all like a rolling stone tomb at all. It looks like a little miniature of what you have in Jerusalem in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. To left and right above, you see the women. They're there at the same time. And down below, you see the, the guards, in this case, both sleeping. And then the fourth final side is the Doubting Thomas story. He's touching Jesus. Now, look at those four. The top two are before the resurrection moment, the resurrection moment. The lower two are after the resurrection moment. Where's the resurrection? Where's the actual moment? What would you have seen if you saw it? If those guards had not lied, but actually told what they saw, as they do in the Gospel of Thomas, in the Gospel of Peter, by the way, what, what would they have described? So a second part, and this is again, staying with facts. I want to look at two different metaphors. If you were, and I once argued with Tom Wright on this point, if you were to take everything in the Gospel on Easter Sunday, literally, no metaphors allowed, no symbols, everything happened exactly as it happened, the, empty to the tomb was found empty. There were multiple apparitions of Jesus. The question is, what metaphors, what models did those people have to explain what was happening? I want to look at the first metaphor because my point here is crucial. Ascension is not the same as resurrection. Resurrection is not the same as ascension. They are different metaphors. To use a kind of a crude example, if, if I say to somebody, you're a chicken, that's a metaphor. If I say to somebody, you're an eagle, that's a metaphor. If I say to somebody, you're a peacock, they're all birds, but they're very different metaphors. So first metaphor is ascension. The Greek word is apotheosis. And the Latin word is deificatio, becoming God, becoming divine. You can see there that beautiful um, ivory icon. Jesus has ascended, supported by four angels, Mary and the uh, apostles are down below. So this is ascension. Now, the question I'm really asking us to consider is why didn't the people who are trying to explain, let's call it Easter Sunday, go for ascension, which is by far, far, far the more common metaphor. It's a metaphor within Judaism. It's a metaphor within Greco-Roman tradition. It's like a cross-cultural metaphor. It's the obvious one to go for. Let me exemplify. Ascension is a metaphor of special exaltation for an individual. No groups allowed, as it were. It's an individual and it is absolutely traditional cross-culturally in both Jewish and Roman cultures. 
it's what you would have expected them to grab for. Let me give you two examples. Ascension or apotheosis of Moses, for example, the lawgiver of Judaism. That's the one you, you recognize the Michelangelo. Here's what Deuteronomy says. Moses died, was buried, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Ah, so there's a little leakage there in the story. You think, well, he's dead and buried, and that's that. Not for Josephus and not for Philo. Josephus. Moses was taken back to the divinity. Of a sudden, the cloud descended upon Moses and he disappeared in a ravine. In the background, we've got a lovely picture of Moses taking off his sandals. That's from Jewish antiquities. So even though he was buried, that fact that somehow nobody knows his grave. So that gives an opening. And Philo does the same. Moses departed from hence to heaven to take up his abode there and leaving this mortal life to become immortal, having been summoned by the father. So the, sh shall I say, the hero founder, lawgiver of Judaism ascended to God. That would have been a perfect model for Jesus as the new Moses. Let me take it now out from Judaism into Romanism and the Greco-Roman world. The ascension or apotheosis of Romulus, the hero founder, if you will, of Romanism. That's taken from a, his statue in the Campidoglia in Rome. He luckily had a good enough picture you could blow it up. So this is the ascension or apotheosis of Romulus. You might say crudely the equivalent, the war maker of Romanism as Moses is the lawgiver of Judaism. In Plutarch, Romulus disappeared suddenly since he had been caught up to heaven and was to be a benevolent God for the Romans instead of a good king. You recognize immediately it's sort of uh, very similar to Philo and Moses, caught up to heaven. In the background, I've given you Romulus and Ramus, as you can see. It's interesting that the Romans, <laughs> they, they start their story with a Cain and Abel story too. The brother Romulus kills Ramus. Also in Plutarch, now he's continuing the same story. He's uh, Romulus would be taken up to heaven, but how do we know? Julius Proclus, and he's given all sorts of credentials. He's highly trustworthy. And he goes into the forum and he tells, traveling on the road, he had seen Romulus, fair and stately as never before, and arrayed in bright and shining armor. So it's almost like parallel to, to Matthew's account. There's a, he's taken up to heaven, so there's no body, there's no tomb, there's nothing like that. Then you have the witness who's seen him, and you have the mandate, very similar to what happens also in, in Matthew. Romulus tells, Proclus, tell the Romans that if they practice self-restraint, <laughs> no comment, and add valor, they will reach the utmost heights of human power. So what we have is both Romulus as the kind of hero founder of Romanism, if you will, Moses as the hero founder of Judaism, are equally taken up to heaven. Apotheosis is their faith. They're taken up to God. And think how easy it would have been for Easter Sunday, if you will, for those people to have said, well, the tomb is empty. We have had apparitions and visions of Jesus. Of course, he's been taken up to God. And then you could build from that metaphor, of course, therefore we could should do whatever Jesus says, etc. So you could build on that metaphor. But I want to look now instead at the second metaphor, the one obviously that was taken. Resurrection. Resurrection. The Greek term is anastasis. And almost always anastasis necron, the resurrection of the dead, resurrection in Latin. 
that's an interesting word, anastasis, by the way, break it down into anastasis. And stasis is a very edgy word in Greek. It's not just rising from the table after a good meal, rising from the bed after a good sleep. A stasis is kind of an insurrection. Now it can be either violent or nonviolent, of course, as we saw last week, but anastasis is like an uprising, literally uprising. So it has a very edgy word, but let me look at resurrection at this metaphor now, focusing on the metaphor. It's a metaphor of general judgment for all humanity. Anastasis Necron is not for you or I or anyone else. It's for all of humanity. And it is traditional at the time of Jesus. I'm not even going to say in Jewish culture widely, but at least in Pharisaic Jewish culture. Therefore, of course, in with Paul. So let's see. Here's what happened. Around about 150, 160 BCE, about 160 years before the time of Jesus, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes was his name, had an epiphany. He was squeezed by the Romans coming from the west, by Egypt coming up from the south, and by the Parthians to his east, and he had an epiphany. He really needed to consolidate the Levantine coast and Israel into his shaky empire before the Romans got there, and he was finding resistance from the more traditional elements within Judaism to his south. And he decided on and thereby invented something that had never happened before, a persecution, a religious persecution. In other words, if you obeyed, if you obeyed your God, you die. If you disobeyed your God, you live. And with that point, there was a crisis, of course, because up to that point, Israel had understood that the way you are rewarded for goodness is in this life and the way you're punished for evil is in this life. And how do you explain Deuteronomic theology as it's called when you're looking at the battered body of the Maccabean martyrs? That lovely fresco from a church dating around 700 in Rome. How do you, how do you explain the justice of God looking at the battered, tortured, executed body of martyrs. There has to be, there has to be some future retribution. Can't be in this life. What we are looking at, quite frankly, and we can almost date it to the year, say 165 BCE, is the invention of what would become eventually heaven and hell. We're watching the invention of eternal life for good or bad, because there wasn't, it wasn't in Judaism before. Everyone went down to Shoal, which is like a condominium complex of graves beneath the earth. It's dark, it's dusty, it's gloomy, it's just like a big grave. Now, when these Maccabean brothers, there's seven brothers and their mother, and while they're being tortured to betray their ancestral traditions. They're saying these things. Now it's pretty heavily pathos and you have to allow it. The king of the universe will raise us up, raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws, says the second brother. The third brother, I got these hands, they're trying to cut off his hands from heaven. Because of his laws, I disdain them and from him, I hope to get them back again, to get them back again. So it's bodily resurrection. It's not just the soul or some kind of a spiritual. So you're looking at the invention of a bodily afterlife, the fourth brother. One cannot but choose to die at the hands of mortals and to cherish the hope God gives of being raised again. This is the technical term. But you persecutors, there will be no resurrection to life. So there's like a resurrection to life and a resurrection to something else. And you get this, of course, also in Daniel. No, sorry, 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 sorry. Let me do the mother first. She's speaking now of her sons. 
The creator will in his mercy give life and breath back to you, speaking of our seven sons, since you now forget yourselves for the sake of his laws. Accept death so that in God's mercy, you may get your lives back again. Then the final statement, the summary one is in Daniel. Many of those, it's not even saying everyone yet, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. The Greek is actually arise. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. In everlasting life and everlasting contempt, you have the first ingredients, of course, of heaven and hell to come. What you've got here is this. Anastasis Necron, the resurrection of the dead, imagines a universal resurrection. And I repeat that this is the point where you can date this. Because how else do you explain the justice of God? It's not that suddenly they began to say, I want to know what's going to happen to me. I want to know if I'm going to last forever. I want to turn. No, no, no. It's about the justice of God. You can't explain the justice of God in this life. Can you? If you're looking at the bodies of a, a martyr. You're, you're looking almost at the death, I think, of Deuteronomic theology, except maybe what they've done is simply postponed it into the next life. Anyway, there will be a universal resurrection. The, all the dead will rise up. And there will be a universal judgment of every human being who's ever lived. And then they will either go off to heaven or to hell. Now, if you take that literally, that's what that means at some point in the future. What I'm going to suggest to you is that we take this as an evolutionary statement that every day, we'll see why I take it this way before we end tonight. Every day, what is going on is a universal resurrection. And every day what is going on is a universal judgment. And every day what is going on is the choice between heaven or hell. Hold on to that for a moment. We'll see what justifies it. The third part then, I'm going to look at the Western tradition and then the Eastern tradition. And my point about the Western tradition is going to be this. When you look at it, are we really talking about resurrection? that say Paul would recognize? Or are we talking about ascension? Are we using resurrection and describing ascension? So watch the tradition, how it develops. We're looking at the individual resurrection of Jesus in Western Christianity. And the important thing is to watch those guards at the tomb, as I said the last time, sometimes sleeping, sometimes watching because we're trying to hold on to the story in Matthew, which is a lie because they say we were asleep and didn't see what happened. And the truth is they were apparently awake and did see what happened. So we were trying to show a picture of them seeing to the left and, and not sleeping to the right. Okay, now here's how the tradition begins. The very first moment we get a situation, we're in the late 300s, and we're in Arles in France. Arles in France, which was probably far more important than, than Rome by the, by the end of the fourth century. What's happening in Arles is of course, Constantine has at least approved of Christianity. And on one of his coins here, you can see two soldiers, two legionary soldiers. They're standing at rest with their spears reversed. You can see the point pointing downwards. Their shield is in their what their right hand or their left hand towards the center, you see the curve of the shield. But the legionary standard is the standard of Christ. It's not a, it is a regular le legionary standard, but on this coin of Constantine the Great, it's the key role that's there, the Chris, Christus monogram. Now, if you read the Latin, unfortunately, it says the glory of the army. So it's a little bit kind of tricky. You've got the glory of the army surrounding Christ, but at least they're at rest. Now, this comes from the Arles Mint. It's a coin of Constantine the Great. It's dated to 335 to 337 from the Arles Mint. And at the same time in Arles, 
in Arles, you've got Christians, it's the end of the fourth century, after 350, well-to-do Christians who want to have a Christian sarcophagus. They want scenes on their sarcophagus, either from the Passion of Christ or the Miracles of Christ. But they tell the artist, now in the middle, we want the resurrection. After all, we're planning to copy it. So we'd like to have a resurrection in the middle. And you can imagine a poor artist say, but, but I don't know how to, to, to depict the resurrection. Well, look it up in the, in the gospel, but, but it's ain't in there. I could put you in the women at the tomb, you know, seeing the empty tomb. I could put in the, the soldiers. No, no, we want the resurrection. And the poor artist has a huge problem. So what he does, and it is brilliant, and we haven't a clue who it was. He's quite happy to put on the surrounding sides to the left, you could see Jesus or Simon of Serena carrying the cross. And then Jesus is kind of crowned, not with a, with a victory cross almost. Then on the other side to the right of the screen, you could see Jesus brought before Pilate washing his hands. That's fine, that's fine. But now this poor artist has to come up with the crucifixion, the anastasis. And his brilliant concept, and of course we have no idea who it is, but it spawns all sorts of copies. I could take the two soldiers from that coin and they kind of like the two soldiers, let's imagine two soldiers from Matthew, one looking up, the one to the left, one to the right, sleeping, they're both leaning on their swords. And then above we have the monogram of Christ, the key row, above the cross, and it'll have a wreath of victory around it. And Christians, as doves, are getting life from this. And the, the artist must have thought, I did it, I got it. Because these are all over Provence, these sarcophagi. The one I'm showing you is from the Pio Cristiani Museum of the Vatican Museums, which has the only good ones. Because all the ones all over Southern France have that central uh, resurrection gouged out, probably during the French Revolution. At least they, the key row is, is ground out. But now, when you look at that, this, that's data from 350, you can see, you could say to yourself, I mean, we're probably cheating to say it, but this is never going to work. Look, everywhere I see Jesus there, the real Jesus standing around bodily, and then all of a sudden in the middle, I get a symbol. Why, why can't you have him in there in the middle, kind of rising? And the poor artist said, I don't know how to do it. And it takes, here's the fascinating thing, in the Western tradition, it takes 500 years to get beyond this to the first time you begin to see Jesus actually in the tomb. And that takes us to stage two, where you see Jesus in the tomb. Now he's not out yet. He's like still in there. The first one is from about 850, that's 500 years later. And by the way, if you ask what kept them from doing the obvious thing of putting Jesus in there. The clue is in that picture because that is the depiction of the sepulcher and the Holy Sepulcher in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem where people were much more interested to imagine Jesus than in any kind of a symbolic or rolling stone tomb or anything else. And I love this one. It's from the gorgeous Stuttgart Psalter it looks like Jesus is kind of waking up and saying, what's going on? What happened? Where am I? He's not even standing up yet. He's not even getting out. But it's the first time you find in the middle of the ninth century, roughly, the visible Jesus in the Western tradition. Now we're talking Western tradition. And remember again, from 350 round numbers to 850, there is no picture of Jesus in the Western tradition coming in, in the tomb, rising from the tomb, anything. So we go to stage three, Jesus emerging. And in this stage, like the picture I'm using for background there, he's never quite out. He's usually shown, look at this one, one foot in and one foot out. He is literally emerging, that's why it's called. And I'm showing you obviously one example of this, but there are, well, I'm going to say hundreds to, th to thousands of them. I usually choose one that is most visually alluring, to be honest with you, not necessarily the first one. 
But notice something about this. Jesus' left leg, of course, is still in the tomb with the angelic chorus going on behind him. But look at his right leg. And this is consistent in the emerging tradition. Again and again, he stands on the soldier. But you might say, well, don't do that. He'll wake up. And hold on to that at the back of your mind. Why would artists showing Jesus coming out of the tomb? He's, you know, see the, the wounded hands and feet. So he's the crucified Jesus. But as I said to you, in this tradition, notice that the cross, it's kind of there at the top of the staff. But the banner looks very much like a crusader banner. As we see in the Eastern tradition, Jesus is carrying a real cross. Not the great wooden one, of course, but a real cross. Still, you're always emphasized it's the crucified one. But hold on to that picture. Why again and again in these pictures, when the soldiers are quietly mind their own business, fast asleep, does he stand on them and presumably wake them up? All right, finally, stage four, and it's about in round numbers 1350 before we get it. Jesus finally clears the tomb as it were. This is a lovely one by 1350. It's from Santa Maria Novella in Florence near the railroad station. You can see to the left here, the women are coming to the tomb. It's, it's all in the same picture. The tomb is empty, the, so, the uh, angels are there. The soldiers are, I think, you know, in this case, all sleeping, maybe one is looking up. And then to the right, of course, you see the, the conversation between Mary Magdalene and Jesus, where he tells her not to go on holding him because he has not yet ascended to God. The rather disgraceful Latin translation is noli me tangere, which is usually translated as don't touch me, as if somehow a woman shouldn't touch him. It has nothing to do with that. It's don't hold me up. I've got business in heaven. But for my purpose, finally, finally, Jesus is clear of the tomb. Now the preceding one, I could take you through if I had more time. He's lying in the tomb, then he's sitting up in the tomb, then he's standing up in the tomb, then he's standing on top of the tomb. And finally, here we get him ascending. If you were showing that without anything down below, without the tomb, you would not be able to tell it from an ascension. He is surrounded by what's called the mandorla of heavenly light. So he is now a heavenly being or going to heaven. And once again, he is carrying the banner. And again, I will notice that the banner is closer to the crusader banner. That is the complete tradition of the Western experience, starting from about 350 all the way to in round numbers, 1350, so a thousand years, let's say. And from then on, this has become really normative. I think pretty much you don't see, the other ones are very seldom. You would not see even the, the emerging one. It's the ascending one. Let me turn now to the, sorry, that's just to show you the emphasis on the, the ascension. The fourth part, the Eastern tradition the Eastern tradition. And again, this is a factual statement. And I think none of us scholars should ever write about the resurrection again, as if the Western tradition was all there was. The Eastern tradition is there. And even if we are able to, to speak of the Western tradition and argue as we do, whether it could be literal, I don't know anyone who's ever that I don't know of anyone, maybe there is somebody, who has argued that the Eastern tradition should be taken literally. So we're talking about the universal, not the individual, Jesus only, the universal resurrection of Jesus in this Eastern Christianity. And this one, which is also actually from that same um, Santa Maria Novella in Florence, it shows Jesus with a crowd. But no matter how many there are, how, no matter how many, if it's a whole crowd, the ones that have to be there are Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. And I think I may have said the last time that you could count on one hand the number of cases where it is 
misogynistic enough just to have Adam alone there, but Adam and Eve, that is our first parents, that is the human race. Once again, if you're asking, where did people get the idea of how to, how to depict this since it's not in there? They got it from the coinage in the East and in the West. And the coinage, of course, is the only mass, really absolute mass communication in the ancient world. These look big now, but they're tiny little bronze or they're like the size of our scent, actually. I don't know if anyone could really read what's on there. But there's three signs and as in the West, so in the East, these are symbols of victory. Coin, imperial coinage, so they're Byzantines now, so we're, it's Christian imperials. But the top one shows the crude fact of victory. The emperor holds the world in his hand. We've seen that before. And he puts his foot on the conquered person. Okay, there's, there's no crude, there's nothing more crude than that. Gotcha. Down below, we have two other symbols of victory, but shall we call them a kinder, gentler propaganda of victory? The one on the left, again, of course, holding the world in its hand with the victory above it, but lifting up the conquered person. She is imagined as a city, that's why she has the crown in her head of the battlements of a city, as it were. And she's half kneeling and he's lifting her up. So he's not really conquering her, he's liberating her. I know you've heard that one before, Con conquest is liberation. We're just liberating you. Notice one thing, of course, she is kneeling. She's coming up, she, the conquered city, is coming from a kneeling position, being raised up. That's why you're going to find in the tradition of the Eastern Anastasis, Adam is kind of half kneeling and Eve is half kneeling even though they're coming out of the sarcophagus. It's the, the continuity between this image and the ones we'll see. Then to the right, the other image is even more, shall I say, propaganda friendly. We're not conquering you. We're not liberating you. We're taking you out from your rustic um, cottages in the forests and we're taking you into the great cities. We're not liberating you, we're civilizing you. So those are the, the images that will be put together to form the Eastern tradition. So stage one, raising up. Now, keep at the back of your mind, the trampling down, which will be applied to Hades, who is the keeper of death, and the raising up for Adam and Eve. Let me look at this one. It's not the earliest because the earliest are so vague as be hard to show. In this case, you're already getting Western influence because down below the gates, you can see not only Hades, Hades is simply the, the guardian of the dead. Satan is the guardian, the guardian of punishment of hell. And as the West starts to infiltrate the East, you, you tend to get Hades transmuting into hell. In this case, you can see Typical Christ, you see the wounds. He's carrying the cross. You can't see it very well. It's behind his head is, but it's a regular cross, as you can see, not a banner. Uh, the cruciform halo on his head, the wounds. In this case, the gates are just down below with all the bolts and bars. And you're imagining Christ bursting into Hades, bursting the, <laughs> the doors open and the, the bars flying in all directions and he's walking over poor old Hades, just don't take it personally, you know, Hades is simply kind of guarding the gate, that's his business, that's his job, keep the dead from getting out, anyone from coming in. Eve, in this earliest ones, is still, you see the ambiguity, on the one hand you say she's waiting her turn after Adam, but wait a minute, she's out already. So what is it? So they, they're already having difficulty saying, well, is she, is she out with Adam or before Adam or after Adam? But in this case, Christ reaches out and he holds the limp wrist. You know, not, it's not a hand clasp because poor Adam has been dead for a long time and he's just kind of waking up. So his, his wrist is kind of limp. So Christ grasps the wrist and lifts him up. This is stage one. Stage two, because maybe you, you think, well, he might just be raising him up to leave him there. No. He's raising him up to take him out. 
So these are the two archetypal models of the Eastern tradition, either raising up or leading out. And again, you see the wounds, again, you see the cross, the cross of the Eastern tradition with the footrest on it and the, the logo above it saying Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And on the preceding one, and in this, you can see this is a mosaic, preceding was, was a fresco, you see, hey, Agia, Anastasis above, the holy Anastasis. So there's never any question what we're looking at here. It's, it's written there for you. And um, poor old Hades, you can see him, he's kind of aged because he's at this a long time too. Christ comes in, the gates, you see the gates of Hades, the bifold gates are flipped into cruciform shape. You can see Christ's wounds, you can see Christ's cross, the cruciform halo. Again, you're never allowed in the Eastern tradition, much more than the Western tradition. This is the crucified one. The power he brings in is the, is the execution. It's the one who's executed for nonviolent rebellion against violence, for nonviolent revolt against violence, who can save the human race from death. Moving then to a, a third, this is a kind of a subtype. Jesus faces out and looks at you. Instead of looking where he's going, as it were, or instead of looking back at Adam and Eve, he looks straight out at you, saying, this too refers to you. And on the left, you get the crowned David to left, crowned and bearded, Solomon to right, crowned and beardless. And it's not clear why we have those two. They're the, the next two that appear after Adam and Eve historically. They're, they're there by, oh, this starts around, say, 700 and round numbers. 100 years later, we're starting to have David and Solomon. People talk about David being there for the Psalms, Solomon for there for the wisdom literature. Personally, I hope I'm not being cynical. You know, I wonder who's paying for all of this stuff. There's monarchs in there somewhere, and monarchs have dynasties, and they'd like a, a good king and at least a supposedly good son up there. So it may be no more profoundly theological than, as the Italians say, chi pagara, who's going to pay for it? Stage four. Finally, this starts around the year 700. It takes about 500 years to the year 1200 before you finally get the first example, not this one, but the first example, this is from about 1350 or so, the first full example of Jesus as an equal opportunity resurrector. You finally get Adam and Eve, each gets a full hand, they're both being yanked out of their sepulcher, and notice they're kind of kneeling, they're being pulled from a kneeling position. And here you have John the Baptist to the left, you, he, you know him because he always needs a shave and a haircut. You have uh, David and Solomon, as I said, beside John the Baptist, he's pointing out Jesus. And then on the other side, you have the fourth character, uh, sorry, the sixth character that appears if, if there are six identifiable ones, that's Abel with his staff. So you have the first martyr of the Old Testament, the first martyr of the New Testament on either side of Adam and Eve and above it, of course, you have hay anastasis. This, as everyone knows, is the anastasis. It's, it's so weird that again and again, Sarah and I found museums where you'd have a, a mosaic like that, or an icon usually in a museum, clearly says hay anastasis or hay agi anastasis, and down below it would say descent into hell, descent into limbo, it, where it says, and that's this right on it, and the proper translation is resurrection. Okay, now, what about Easter as resurrection? I'm putting it in quotation marks. I want you to, to imagine something. I love this. This is uh, another of my favorite um, mosaics from uh, the Cathedral of Mary's Assumption in Moriale, just outside Palermo in Sicily. If you ever get a chance to see it, please do. I love this because it shows Paul speaking with three of his fellow Pharisaic Jews. And they're not caricatured. They're honorable. They're see seated on a, you know, a, a throne, like really. And they're in no way caricatured, but he's having a debate with them. 
And I'm imagining that debate, the debate, that the debate is this. They're asking him now. This is me. They're asking him this question. They're seated there. They've got their books, scrolls. They know their tradition, and they're saying to Paul, as it were, "But Paul, resurrection is never individual. It's always universal. You know that." So how can there be an individual resurrection of Jesus, whom you call the Christ? You just can't do that. You're talking about an ascension, Paul. So why do you call it a resurrection? And we know the answer that Paul gives them. Christ is raised from the dead. Necron, ex necron the first fruits of those who have slept, the way we translate it. And of course, it's not meaning those who have slept, but those who have slept in the sense that they could be raised. That's the only answer I can think of him able to give. Of course, the answer he does give. And that's why Paul cannot imagine arguing with the Corinthians, if there is no general resurrection, there's no Jesus resurrection. If there's no Jesus resurrection, there's no general resurrection. And nobody would say to him, but couldn't there be a Jesus resurrection just for Jesus? The answer is no, that's an ascension. So the challenge I get for this, and this is now where, where my interpretation of it. Jesus said, as I understand it, that the kingdom of God using his his metaphor, divine, the divine rule on earth, the divine rule on earth is already here if you get with the program. That's, I understand it in a simple term, the message of Jesus. It's not coming soon. It's not coming imminently. It is already here if and only if you get with the program because you can't, as I said, have a kingdom of one. Now, Paul, following from that, knows that he can't just talk of ascension. So the only way he can imagine it, and it must have stunned him, it, this must be how he was able to come from being a Pharisaic Jew to being a Messianic Jew, a Messianic or what I call a Christic. As I said, I don't use the word Christian at this stage, I use the word Christic, like Messianic. He changes from being a Pharisaic Jew who believed in the resurrection, and then it was like, an epiphany. So we were right to think all the time about the general resurrection. It's already started. Now, please understand how absolutely astounding that is. It's much more astounding than saying Jesus has taken up to God. Everyone would say, well, yeah, yeah, that happens. Maybe we don't think your guy was taking up to God, but Romulus was and Moses was. And yeah, there was that scene of Moses and Elijah with Jesus, that's kind of an ascension scene. So yeah, it's, yeah, sure, it's possible. They had to admit it was possible. It was all over their culture. But resurrection? If the resurrection has already begun, then that would mean the general resurrection, excuse me, the general judgment has already begun. Nobody said there would be a resurrection. And, and then the harvest starts and continues. So you're telling us, Paul, that if we join this program, we are living resurrected lives and therefore the general judgment is going on too. It's not just there's a general, um, a general resurrection we offer in the future and judgment and heaven and hell we often, it's all happening right now. So, the judgment is going on right now. And please understand, I'm hearing this from an evolutionary frame of reference, not just from theological, ethical, moral, or anything else, or religious even. Then heaven and hell are going on right now. They are options, as I said, in the present, rather than locations in the future. So if we were to take seriously the Eastern tradition, if we were to take seriously Paul, because I'm convinced that if somebody had said to Paul, okay, Paul, we know this execution. We, we know what that is like. We've seen crucifixions. 
We know what they're like. Could you draw us a resurrection? Could you draw us what, what the resurrection looked like? Paul would never, ever, I think, have drawn anything in the Western tradition. I'm not saying he'd draw Adam and Eve. I don't know how he'd have done it. But he would certainly have tried to show that this was for everyone. And then that means then that when Paul <laughs> gives his epistle to whoever takes it out, then the message is resurrection has begun. Judgment has begun. Heaven and hell has begun. And that's exactly, of course, what we saw in Colossians. You have been raised with Christ. How else could he have used the past? You have been. All right, let me get out of that and back to regular screen. All right, so I think we can open it for questions, Dennis. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask you to send your questions to the chat and I will read them out uh, for Dominic um, in that capacity, so fire away. Unless we have solved everything. It has all been made clear. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, there's one. Okay. Uh, from uh, Elizabeth. Dominic, are you assuming Paul wrote Colossians? No, no, no. I, I'm assuming that it's not possible for anyone to get everything wrong. <laughs> no, I don't think Colossians was written by Paul. To be honest with you, <clears throat> I think Colossians especially where it has to do with the relation between slaves and and their masters or mistresses, women, and, and is anti-Pauline, post-Pauline, subverting Paul. And, and I find very often in Colossians and in Ephesians that the danger is not that Christ is becoming too transcendental, because it cannot be too transcendental for me since Caesar Augustus is already out transcendental these lean him, but as Jesus rises up to heaven, the footprints leave the earth. That's what I'm worried about, but when it's like Colossians or Ephesians. But no, I don't think Paul wrote it, and parts of it are, are really, I describe it as Elizabeth, as you know, as anti-Pauline. Okay, a couple of really coming in now. Dom, uh, from Kate uh, Silfen. Dominic, what does this vision of resurrection mean for the future of the church? Well, I would, I would ask it gently to say that the church involves the Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity, if Eastern Christianity manages to survive at all. And I think we would have to ask at least that factual question, what, what do we do with those two traditions? I would be very happy to see something that happens actually, it's not in our book because of, <laughs> we didn't know it at the time is the reason, there's a lot of 15th and 16th century Russian icons that show sort of a upstairs downstairs, in which downstairs Christ liberates the human race as it were, typical as we've seen in the Eastern tradition. Then upstairs, he comes out from the tomb to tell people go do it, <laughs> which I rather like. <laughs> you know, it, it puts the two traditions together. I think the church should start trying to get serious about resurrection because in the last 25 years speaking to progressive Christians, I find they're quite at home at Christmas. I mean, that can be understood, but they're deeply embarrassed by Easter. I mean, you can somehow get from, from Christ, the gift of the incarnation to the gifts of Santa Claus, you can kind of get there, but Easter eggs and Easter bunny are harder. I find many times Easter People were embarrassed by it, didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to preach about it. If they thought it was a metaphor, they didn't want to say there because they thought that was just a metaphor, which meant nothing. 
So I think the church should at least look at those things, ask the question, why is it never described? Did you freeze over, I think? Dominic, okay, he's frozen. And I will not pretend to try to answer anything. We have to do. There he is, okay. To pledge the book. <laughs> you were frozen there for a second, Dom. All right, sorry. Now we have a large one from uh, Johan. How would you relate Paul's message of crucifixion slash execution and resurrection to the rituals of baptism in Romans 6 and the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 11, first baptism? Would you argue that Paul thought of the baptismal ritual as an enactment of crucifixion or execution and communal resurrection in Romans 6? Secondly, in the case of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. Okay. Hold the second question. Okay. I I define once I once I pass 85, by the time I answer the first question, I'd have forgotten the second one. And if I, if I go with the second one, I've forgotten. Got it, got it. So baptism, you okay. Thank you for that question. Really, really, really thank you for that question. I'll tell you why. Because that's exactly what Paul imagines. What you are doing, when he says you've died with Christ. And he's telling the living people. How, how how in baptism do they die with Christ? because Christ was executed by Rome and died to Rome and rose to life. Where you see it most clearly is when early Christianity, now we're into you know, the 300s, 400s, when they had to, how did I put this? When, when in their churches, they had to have a baptismal site, I'm talking very carefully, a baptismal site. What they did is not make a font, they dug a grave. You can see it at St. John, the, the evangelist in, in near Ephesus, you can, it's still there. Well, they're all over the North Africa too. You literally went down steps into the water, probably with, you know, discreet clothes on, but you were taking off your clothes because you came up the other side, you, you took off your, you were reenacting Adam and Eve because you went down naked as it were, except for whatever, whatever proprieties that, that were observed and you came up the other side and put on the garments. You took off the garments of shame. You died with Christ, literally, but that meant you died to Roman normalcy. This was an act of quiet treason. Now, I don't mean that they went out, and, but they were, Christ had died by Roman law and order, if you will. You were dying to Roman law and order and you were raising, coming up the other side. I think the best understanding of Romans 6, and thank you for this question, is by imagining exactly these baptismal graves, I'm going to call them, are sometimes baptismal sarcophagi. They're kind of built up, but they're always in cruciform shape. Even though you're going down and coming up, there's a cross bar on it. And the only reason is that you're, you're dying with crucifixion. Now you're not being crucified. I don't think the main job of early Christians was to get themselves crucified. I really don't think that's the best way to promote a religion. Martyrs are one thing, but genocide is something else. So it's actually, you could see it in those first times they had to come up and say, I, I have to design a baptismal place. What's it like? They went straight to Romans, Romans six and imagined it. Now turn into the Eucharist. See, I remembered the Eucharist, Think of, think of death. We think of death usually as a separation of body and soul, we say. That's normal death. The separation of body and blood is lethal death. It's execution in pain language. Now, I'm not imagining Christ at the Last Supper. I'm imagining this as early Christianity or early Christics saying to themselves, how do we bring together the life of Christ with its insistence on sharing food, and the death of Christ for which he getting killed for demanding the justice of sharing food. The separation of body and blood is the death of Christ. There's no other reason why it's, you could think of bread and wine, you could think of bread and water, bread and wine is the Mediterranean food. If it was, if Jesus was an Irish peasant, we probably would have spuds and buttermilk. I tend to prefer Mediterranean diet, so I'm happy with that. But bread 
Red and wine is simply Mediterranean diet. We're thinking red wine too, by the way. That's the separation of the body and blood of Christ. That's the death of Christ. But he dies for insisting on the justice of the fair distribution of food. Give us this day our daily bread. You don't even ask in the first century for a fair distribution of land. That'll get you <laughs> exterminated even faster. Just a fair distribution of food, which is what Jesus did, of course, but did it as an act of justice, not as an act of hospitality. So the Eucharist, I think, is the perfect, perfect combination by those first followers of putting together the life of Christ and the death of Christ. Both of those sacraments got it right. But in, in, in that, about the Last Supper, what Johann concludes with is, it's crucifixion uh, and execution are clear there, but rest, and if resurrection is so intimately linked, why is resurrection not mentioned in the Eucharistic element? I would imagine the fact that we're doing it in church is the resurrection. I mean, it's not, it wouldn't be clearly mentioned possibly in the, in the baptism, though it is more clear, you're right, in Romans. I'm trying to think, is there anywhere? <clears throat> I, I can only think, Joanne, of do this in memory of me, that it, m memory. Nomnesis. Well, I, I'm thinking, especially when, whenever it appears in early Christian documents, remember. Remember always seems to mean to do. You remember what Christ, remembering the, the patience of Christ means be patient. It doesn't mean, oh yeah, I remember he was, he was really patient. So I'm wondering if that is the closest we get there, that the resurrection is doing this in memory of Christ and it's taken for granted. I, I think, I'm thinking of my feet, I think I'm, I'd slip over to what, to First uh, Corinthians where Paul's having trouble with them and their enactment of the Lord's Supper, the Lord's style of supper. And he insists that the fair distribution of food is simultaneous with the sharing of the cup and the breaking of the bread. I can only think of that, that that is what the resurrected life looks like. And that Paul is warning the Corinthians don't dare come near this meal if you don't know what you're doing. Because what you are doing is publicly committing yourself to live a life of distributive justice, food, at the risk of your own death. That's why he's telling the Corinthians, don't go near it unless you know what you're doing. So I think it's there, not verbally, but I'd imagine that's the way I go after it anyway to try and think about it. Elizabeth, you wanted to come in on that? Um, yeah, I was thinking, what I was thinking of, um, what it reminds me of, Dominic, is uh, Mark 4, uh, 14, 25, when it says, truly I tell you, I will never drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the reign of God. Okay, yes. So yes. if you're drinking it now, then you must be in the reign of God. The reign of God, right. Yes, that would, that would be perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. And Johan goes on with, Finally, it's often claimed that myth, belief, explains ritual and that ritual enacts myth, belief. If this is the case, would the individual versus universal resurrection traditions have had an effect on baptismal practices in the West and East respectively? Or would you claim that relating beliefs and ritual practices in this way is not valid and that we should understand the relationship between these two elements of religion, of belief and ritual differently? Okay, let me, let me take that for a second. I think in the West, this West, this whole distinction between East and West, obviously geographically always correct, in the first millennium, in the first millennium, up to the split between East and West, I would think the, both of them were equally using that grave. <laughs> I would think the, the ritual would be exactly the same in East and West, as really they're thinking about the resurrection metaphor was probably very similar east and west until, until the split. I'm inclined to think that ritual, I know I'm, I'm, I'm in danger of, of chicken and egg, I'm um, 
does ritual create myth or myth create ritual or are they in a dialectic? Because certainly, certainly in this case, there's no ritual, but I, I take this back. I, I, know, I know that our driver on Cyprus, who she was, a, she was British, she was married to a Greek Cypriot. And when she saw this, Sarah and I kept going to all of these churches and zeroing right, <clears throat> right in on the resurrection. They asked us, said one day in the car to us, <clears throat> look, I see what you're doing. I, one thing I can't understand about Easter, my mom comes over here for Easter every year and we go to the, the mid, I'm using my terminology, midnight mass or the service at the Greek Orthodox Church in Patras where we were a tiny village. And she said, the oldest man in the village is inside holding the door and the young priest comes and pushes in the door. And I think that's so unfair to have the oldest man in the village holding up the door against this young virile man. I'd never heard of it before. It's the ritualization of the Eastern Orthodox myth, if you will. Actual still working, at least in this small village. Now, maybe this is simply my ignorance. Maybe it happens all over the place. I'd never heard of it before. So that's the ritualization of it. I'm trying to think how old would that ritualization be? Could it go back to, you know, the earliest days in the 700s? I, I literally don't know. It's a doctor dissertation for somebody. But it's the right thing we're doing now. We're thinking about this and trying to expand it and think more about it. So don't think any answers are really answers. They're probes and inducements to thought. And from Egypt, Father Nabil. In the writings of early church fathers, the apostolic fathers, in the late first and early second, meaning Clement of Rome, Ignatius Polycarp, we can see that the early Christian communities believed in a bodily resurrection. Do you agree with that sentence? I agree with a bodily resurrection within a metaphor. I'm not, I'm not, don't, don't think I'm playing games. You could have a metaphor in which Jesus' soul arises up to God. You could have a metaphor of that. But the bodily resurrection means that the body of Jesus, that the wounds, the wounds, the cross is still part of the metaphor. You can't take that out. I would never have been satisfied, though I understand completely in the 350s, why all over Provence you had those Arles sarcophagi. No. That doesn't, that doesn't tell me what I want to know, that the executed body of Christ alone can resurrect, can save the human race. I'm, I'm using it in the sense of his nonviolent resistance. That is what saves the human race from death. So I want the body in there, but it's the body within a metaphor. I mean, I'm thinking of, of an illustration. If somebody says, that I float like a butterfly, I sting like a bee. If somebody were to say that, they're talking about their body. They're not talking about their soul. Now it's clearly a metaphor. There's no stinging <laughs> and floating, but it's a, it's a metaphor about the body. So yes, I want the body in there, but I'm not taking it literally. But if you took the body out of it, we're not talking about the same thing at all. Then you're talking about something like a platonic deliverance of the soul which the first Corinthians 15 would probably be quite happy with. That's what probably bother them. Okay, another question from uh, this one from Sal. How do you imagine that Paul got his perspective on Christ's message? Did he have a lengthy conversation with him when Christ appeared to him? The way I imagine it. Now I'm asking you please to bracket Luke because even the same thing said three times doesn't make it history. It just makes it repetition. Paul was a Pharisaic Jew. Paul believed utterly in the resurrection. This is the bond. Now he hears about these Jesus, these, <laughs> I was going to say Jesus freaks, let's say, whatever he calls them. I'm imagining he's in the synagogue at Damascus. I am not imagining he's mandated by the high priest in Jerusalem to exercise rendition a bit ahead of its time by taking 
people from Damascus back to Jerusalem. That's simply not believable. That's Luke, that's fine. Luke is Luke and Paul is Paul. I think he's in the synagogue at Damascus and he's having trouble with these Christians and what they're saying. And I think his epiphany, his revelation is that he has a vision of the risen Lord. I think he does. I don't think he has it on the road, but I think he has it because he tells me he has it in Galatians and he swears he's not lying. So I take it for granted. I think he has a vision of the crucified risen Lord. I think it's all in that vision. It's not a glow of light. Please, I, I can't forgive Luke for doing that. A glow of light means Jesus didn't see Jesus. Paul didn't see Jesus. But Paul's whole authority, integrity, apostolic identity means that he saw Jesus. Not he, not he had a big light or a flashing light or anything else, or he was blinded. So I would think at that moment, two things came together. Jesus was the crucified one. Now, you don't persecute your fellow Jews, messianic Christics, unless you know what they're doing. Persecuting people tend to know exactly what you're saying with great precision. So of course Paul knew all about Christianity. Of course he did, otherwise he wouldn't have persecuted his fellow Jewish messianic Christics, even though he was non-messianic. So yes, of course he learned. I'm, I have no doubt when he met Peter and I'm sure Peter kind of rubbed it in his face that we, you know, I, I walked the Galilean roads with Jesus and you didn't. And Paul probably said, well, we don't know him that way any longer, <laughs> as, he, as he says. But I think he didn't have to be told about Jesus. He knew enough from persecution and then his own epiphany. But the epiphany was between Phariseeism and Messianism. I don't see, are there other questions? Yep. Um, from Johan again, I'm still wondering about your interpretation of Paul's notion of resurrection, according to which the resurrection of the dead ones has already started with Christ's resurrection, okay. rather than being viewed by Paul as, a, as an event that would happen only at Christ's return. How would you interpret 1 Corinthians 15, 23, where Paul stating a chronological order, uh, tagma, in which the dead would rise. First, he says, Christ has risen, uh, aparche, or first fruit from the dead ones. Then, epita, at Christ's per, uh, parousia, those who belong to him will be made alive. Zupoi sontai. And then, epitai, the end, when Christ will hand over the kingdom to God. Is the resurrection of all, or rather more narrowly, of those who belong to Christ, as those who have fallen asleep, not here imagined as an apocalyptic event as with the Pharisees, and then intention with the metaphor of the first fruits of those who sleep as interpreted by you. All right, two points. Paul never gives up this Pharisaic idea that there's some great grand finale in the future. He never gives that up. Paul never gets to, to, to dream, as we know, we're talking about at least 2000 years. That's not there. Paul was convinced until the day he died, I think, it would be within my lifetime. And maybe, maybe if not within my lifetime, because I could get executed, at least within our lifetime. Now, that's what he has to deal with. What I really object to in modern scholarship, and I'm talking now to my colleagues, is to shift the whole emphasis to that latter one. Because I can go through, not just Paul, but most of the Gospels, and come up with a scenario that puts all the emphasis on that future moment. I do not think Paul put all his emphasis on that future moment. I think he only even bothered talking about that future moment when the Thessalonians and the Corinthians hung him up on it and wanted to know, inquiring minds, how about? So I think if Paul was left to himself, what he wanted to do was insist on how we're supposed to be living now. And I think it probably, when the Thessalonians wanted to know, yeah, but some of our people have died. And, you know, what's going to happen to them? 
and he comes up with the brilliant idea that, well, it won't that we'll all arise, they'll get there first. Because at the Perusia of Christ, as, as the emperor comes into any Roman city, the first people he meets are the great imperial tombs, uh, the great aristocratic tombs along the way in. So those who are dead, martyrs will get first chance. But I don't think, honestly, that that regulates Paul's theology. And I think we have done something wrong by focusing so much of our interest on the apocalyptic moment. It's there. Yeah, you're quite right. You know, you, I can give you it in Matthew and, and Mark and everyone else too. It's all there. And in one sense, I think that's exactly what we want to do. From the very beginning, you're told, get with the program. And inquiring minds want to say immediately, yeah, 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 fine. But when will it be over? When will it be over? And I think Paul would have said, it'll never... It'll never be over unless it gets started. So I think whether Jesus thought it would all be over soon, Paul certainly, I think Mark did too. I think Q, the Q gospel probably does too. I think that's inevitable. Once you're told you have to do this, then let's not talk about how to do this. Let's talk about when it'll be over. And when we're doing that, we're not doing it. So I think Paul never really probably gets that totally into one coherent systemic theology because he never dreams that we might be talking about 2000 years and how we will solve questions like handling the empire <laughs> when it becomes Christian or anything else. Okay. Anything, any other questions coming up, coming in? Going once, going twice. All right, would you, would you let me do something? Sure, Dr. absolutely. I wanted to conclude, if I can still get back to my screensaver, let me see it. I wanted to show you something. It, it's not, well, I suppose it is also an advertisement for the book. <laughs> No, that's okay. But it's for something else as well. I really would ask you to read the book and to do the sort of things that we're doing here, thinking about it, you know, pushing it. What if this is, what if there's validity here? How, how does it change things? And especially though, I, I want you to read the dedication. It's dedicated to Eastern Christians who suffer greatly, who live dangerously, and who survive precariously in the original heartland of Christianity. And by that, I mean everything east of Greece. Adam and Eve represent all humanity. And thank you very, very much for your questions, for your concentration, and have a very happy, healthy, and holy Easter. Thank you so much, Dominic. Uh, again, let me, uh, we're all back together there, okay. Um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your wisdom, your challenge um, to those of us who sometimes get stuck in one particular thing where the tradition, the dead hand of the past <laughs> has, has come and been a heavy hand. Mortis metaphors. There, there we are. Um, I mean, I think of uh, uh, Pelican um, used to say, the tradition is the dead hand of the past that weighs heavy on our future. But what tradition is, is really looking at that past and developing further and, and moving forward. So I, I think what you have done for us is in some way lift that heavy hand um, and force us to think more clearly on, um, on greater ramifications of what our faith is, is to entail and, and what it means. And um, 
I appreciate that personally. And I thank you on behalf of St. Luke's and I thank Sal for getting in touch with you and, and getting through to you to be part of this. And I thank all the people that have participated. I see, wait a minute, a couple of things in the chat room here, let me see. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, absolutely wonderful. Um, so I just uh, wanna say on behalf of St. Luke's, how appreciative I am of you participating. And Elizabeth, while you're still here, I wanna thank you again as well, because it has made March a wonderful month uh, for, for us in exploring Mark and in exploring the week that we're about to enter, the great week, uh, and uh, looking at all the events that will come up ritually. Uh, and thank, thank you, Egeria, uh, for, for giving us that history. But, but it, it might make a, a difference this year for the people at St. Luke's. So I thank you as their rector uh, for that. Um, both of you for helping us out. So, and to all of those of you around the world and those from Grace uh, Episcopal in Brooklyn, uh, thank you for, for joining us. And those elsewhere from all sorts of backgrounds, thank you. South Africa, Egypt, England, Canada, uh, all of you, um, US all over, thank you very much. God bless you, Dominic. Happy Easter to you and Sarah. God bless you, Elizabeth. Happy Easter to you and your family as well. To everyone. Great. Okay, guys. See y'all later. He's out of here. Click, 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 click. Oh, I love that heron. Okay. <laughs>